Hello, my name is Jim Fortune. I'm the president of Fortune Shepler Elevator Consultants, and uh, I've been in this business almost 40 years now. It's hard to believe, but you know you're getting old in the elevator business when you uh, start modernizing the building that you designed originally for the second time. Anyhow, my speech today is about elevator destination dispatching. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstandings of what it is and what it does. And although I got to tell George is absolutely correct, wherever we go in the world today, architects and owners and designers say, we got to have destination dispatching elevators without really knowing why they want that and uh, what it does for them. But uh, I thought I'd touch on the history of destination dispatch, where it came from, uh, talk about some of the uh, concepts and then talk about some things that we could do in the future to improve it. Let's see if I got this slide right. Green one? Got it. Okay. How many people are in this audience are old enough to remember riding on a manually operated elevator with an attendant on board? Anybody? Not very many. <laughs> You're showing your age. Anyhow, that's where destination dispatch came from. If you think about it, it's a, it's a people input function. So what happens in the old days before we had automatic elevators, which were actually invented in the early 50s, uh, people would come into a building and there was, oh, whoops, hit the wrong one. There was a, um, a person we call a lobby director. They were sometimes called dispatchers. And typically that was a man and the, uh, then we had people on the elevator operators who ran the elevators, and they were typically women. Why that turned out that way, I don't know, but it, <laughs> it was a segregation of the uh, sexes, I guess. But anyhow, the, the lobby director person, most people thought, well, all he did was greet people. But he did, actually did a lot more functions than you think of. And a lot of these things done today are done with destination dispatch. So the first thing he did, he, he probably knew all the people in the building and he probably greeted them. And how do you know that? He knew them by their face recognition. And then uh, he'd keep out undesirable people. People who weren't authorized to be in the building couldn't come in. And then we had, he also was a building security floor checker. So if you weren't authorized to be there, he'd say, what are you doing in my building? Get out. And then he was a destination sorter. He knew who the people were and he knew who were on contiguous floors or on the same floor. So what would he do? He'd look at these people and say, okay, you and you go get on elevator B because he knew you were going to the same floor or going to contiguous floors. So pretty much the same thing that Destination Dispatch does today. He could have gender separations. I know that's not big in the Western world, but it's pretty big in the Muslim world. And he handicapped person, he would tell them uh, somebody in a wheelchair could come in and he would assign them to one elevator. And uh, if the owner of the building came in, he would assign him one trip on a special elevator. Or if he was you know, a VIP person, he could do the same thing. And then he would uh, tell the elevators when to relieve. And so what he would do is he could tell very quickly if an elevator is full, well, there's no reason to keep loading more people on there, we'll just dispatch it immediately. So once he did all these functions, now the elevator is loaded and ready to go, he would m motion to the, uh, one of the elevator operators and say, okay, it's your turn to depart. And so what would the operator do? They actually control the doors and the gates and they would dispatch the elevator. But first thing they had to ask somebody was, what's your destination if they did not know them in the building? And then they would take them to the, they close the doors. Sometimes they had a car switch operation. Anybody ever seen those where you accelerated and decelerated with a car switch? And then uh, let them off at the floors. And then typically they go up the top floor and uh, they might announce in a, last, I think the last place that had uh, manual operating elevators are probably large department stores because it was a more of a personal inner function thing, so it's a, as you're going up and say ladies' underwear or men's lingerie in San Francisco or whatever. Anyhow, so they were really controlling what was happening. And then this operator would take the elevator up to the very top floor and wait for a signal from the lobby director to come back down. That was called two terminal dispatch. 
and so they'd actually wait there. So his whole intent was to keep the traffic flowing through the building and to keep a, a decent interval between dispatches. So that type of, and then when the 50s, we got what we call conventional two-button two button dispatching. And uh, two-button refers to the fact that typically when you walk over to a lobby, you have an up button and a down button that you register your travel direction. And uh, obviously, that, even today, we're still selling uh, two-button dispatching in certain types of environments. And the beauty of two-button dispatching, when you come in the morning or at any floor, uh, all you have to do is know to get on the proper car going in the right direction, hopefully, and then register your destination and tie the car on what we call a car operating panel, or COP. And then uh, before the car arrived, you would get an indication of which car is arriving and you uh, either up or down direction. The problem with this system in very large elevator groups, it's very difficult to tell which one, if the one behind you is coming or the one way down at the end is coming, it's very difficult to see that. And so um, then inside the car you had a travel direction, told you which way the car was going and then would it tell you when you arrived at your floor and then you were trusted to get out of the right floor. With destination dispatching, we have completely different types of controls. Typically, there's no buttons inside the elevator. And the uh, early versions were mimicking what we had in a, on a keypad. Here we call keypad input devices. So you notice it's shaped just like a, a telephone, digital telephone. And then typically, the lift assignment that you're assigned to. So, you, so if I wanted to go to, say, 23, I would register 23. And then immediately the assignment we say go up and queue in front of car A. And uh, so this is the input device typically in the, each elevator lobby and there's multiple devices. And then the uh, later versions are now more like a computer touchpad. Have no physical buttons that actually move, you touch things. And um, then once you queue up in front of an elevator, you wait till it arrives, and then once the car is open, this is not a good graphic because it shows the door is closed, but you don't see this enunciator until actually the doors are open. It's inside the jam of the car. And um, still has the same position indicator inside the car in the travel direction, but it does not have the buttons for the car operating panel. Except in the U.S. we have to have, uh, because all our elevators are equipped with what we call phase two firefighters operation, you have to have a panel that can open up so the fireman can run the car under two-button dispatch. I stole this from Coney, I apologize. Uh, this is a great graphic. It shows uh, what happens with two-button dispatching. People obviously come into a lobby and they're all milling around in the lobby and whichever car arrives first, obviously at the ground floor, you're probably all going up. So whichever car arrives, people scramble to get to the car. So if I'm way down here and this car arrives down here, I have to wade through people in a very heavy traffic environment. And so it, it, you know, it's worked quite well for many, many years, but people get, uh, particularly in a very heavy environment, that's why we're pretty typically we're limited to eight car groups because it just simply took too far to get from this car to that one if you tried to create a nine or ten car group. Although we were doing the modernization in the World Trade Centers in New York and they had two sets of Sky Lobby shuttles, there was actually 11 or 12 elevators in a row, original design. and There was no way if you were down at the end car that you'd get the other one. So they finally broke it up into two five or six car groups in a row. Whoops, I went too far, sorry. This one shows the same type of arrangement but with destination dispatch lobby. So obviously people are, once you make you get your assignment, you queue up in front of the elevator and as soon as it arrives, everybody going to the same or contiguous floors boards the elevator. So it's much more efficient because I'm not concerned. And psychologically, uh, there's a lot of psychology in destination dispatch. So as soon as I register my destination, I get my assignment, I. Uh, walk over and queue up in front of the elevator and then board the car when it comes and I don't have to worry about registering the call. I do want to check on the uh, 
enunciator and the jam to make sure I'm on the right elevator. Uh, when we first saw one of the original destination dispatches at the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield building in Los Angeles, we went out there and they had taken these panels and the parking lot was on both sides of the building about a, probably a hundred yards away. So they had these all along that walking panel coming into the building. And so people would register their destination and then they literally would, once they got the assignment, would start running because they were scared to death the assignment by the time they got the lobby would be gone. It was amazing to watch them. And then invariably they'd come up and then register another call just to make sure they were on the right car. So there's some limitations on how far you want to put these panels away from the elevator lobbies. So here's a conventional arrangement that we all are familiar with. You know, we have up to eight cars, and typically if you had an eight-car group, you'd have uh, four opposite four. And uh, typically we have, you won't find many groups that have a 10-car group with five opposite five because of the obvious problem of running down there. But with destination dispatch, then that becomes infinitely possible. Because the beauty of that is I don't have to, once I get my assignment, I can leisurely walk and queue up in front of my elevator. How many people are staying in the hotel here, the Grand Hyatt? You know, so it's a, when you get to the upper floor on 54, that's a six car group, do you notice that? Highly unusual, but what makes it work is it has an early version of what we call uh, hall call allocation, or uh, Otis used to call it instantaneous car assignment. The Japanese would call it prediction hall landing. So you notice, when you go up there this evening, push the button, you'll notice you immediately get a hall lantern that tells you which car is going to pick you up. So it's the same kind of effect. You can start walking over to the car, and then when it arrives, if it arrives, you get on board. The problem with uh, that type of hall lantern is if somebody holds the doors, it has no way of you telling you that the car may not be coming. And ultimately, they'll make a new assignment. So that's called a misprediction. The other problem we have in architectural design today is a lot of architects like to design corridors that have what we call a, a single loading corridor, which means you can only come in one entry level. Not this, is, this wall is not open, so you can't come in this way or this way. You can only come in this way. So again, psychologically, people are funny. With a two-button system, you notice rather than coming in and walking in the lobby, most people won't do that. They're waiting for an elevator, but they're afraid that if they get in here, they're trapped and this car comes, I can't get back out. So, you know, as the people fan out, they fan way out, which is not a good situation because by the time the car arrives, so what have we done historically? We try to put the input buttons down here to force them to come in there, but they still won't do it. And so they may, they'll waste a lot of time waiting and fanning out from the lobby. Where with destination dispatch, again, there's psychologically, I already know my assignment, so there's no advantage to waiting out here. I come right into the lobby and get on board as soon as the elevator comes. Here's some of the advantages of destination dispatch. And there are multiple advantages. I know I'm going to be a hair tech and say not every building needs destination dispatch because typically we don't need to improve the... Uh, particularly on a brand new building, we don't need to improve the morning up peak. It's like a, how many people go out and wait for a bus and a 50 person bus arrives and there's three people want to get on board. You're not going to wait, the bus driver's not going to wait for another 47 people to get on board until they arrive. So the same thing happens if you use destination dispatch and you know, you can do all these studies that said, yeah, I increase the handling capacity to 20% or 30%. We don't need it. The only time you would need it is if you uh, increase the population in the building for some unforeseen reason when they rent out the space. So it's probably more of an assurance policy than it is a necessity. Well, I'm not advocating you don't get destination dispatch because everybody wants to have the latest and the greatest. And uh, if you don't have it, you'd probably be, have a lot of criticism from your neighbors brand new buildings oh that building doesn't have destination dispatch what's wrong with those guys but the, it is a big improvement on an existing building with a modernization so typically you get a lot of under elevated buildings and that's the big
biggest improvement, like George said, for uh, doing a modernization. So I can't imagine hardly in any building doing a modernization and not putting on destination dispatch just because the tenants and the visitors to that building then realize there's something new going on and it's a brand new system. But so what, what does it do? It, uh, typically it's during the morning up peak performance. So, and typically it's on, in office buildings. So for an office building design, I don't know how many people know, but Johannes did a good job of explaining how we go through probability theory and we design the number of elevators required. And it's all based on waiting time and how much handling capacity we need to move the people in a, in a typical one hour peak. So office buildings typically have an AM one hour peak and we pick up we pick up peak 15 or excuse me five minutes which is 300 seconds to design for that and so the real question is how many dispatches during the five minute peak can we make so at a conventional system if i have a five minute peak that's 300 seconds and i'm looking for a 30 second interval which is the frequency of departures from elevators from the ground floor that means that probably i can make no more than 10 dispatches 10 to 12 with destination dispatch because it's assigning people to a similar car and making fewer stops in the up direction the probability of stops is much less so typically a destination dispatch system in an office building will make no more than three four five stops whereas a conventional system will make the number of stops based on the car load and how many potential upper four stops it has and so that's why it works. A lot of people don't know why. It, why does destination dispatch work? Because it makes more dispatchers. So by doing that, it improves the handling capacity. But again, I said we probably don't need to increase handling capacity if the building is elevated properly. And so herein lies, you know, what do we use for percentage of handling capacity? Well, typically in office buildings, we've always used 12% as a default number. You say, well, that means that 12% of the population is arriving during this peak five minutes. That's not true. It's not arriving. It's probably typically 6 to 8%. The reason we've always used 12% is to design the elevators not only for the morning up peak, but for, for the evening out peak. In Asia, it's the evening lunchtime peak because people go to lunch together. So that's a down peak. So if we really only have to handle 6 to 8% for this morning up peak, uh, why are we designing for 12%? It's for the evening out peak. And that's where people go wrong when they say, gee, if I put on destination that dispatch, I can save one elevator per group. That's not true at all. You can't save one elevator per group because if you do, now you don't have enough handling capacity for the evening out peak and you're going to start stranding people on the upper floors. So that's why we're big advocates of, even though we do destination dispatch with what we call simulated computers and, and the output is average waiting time and transit time, which are not the same as the outputs for uh, conventional dispatching. So we always do conventional dispatching first or an analysis to see how many elevators we need. And then we prove the solution with destination dispatching. The other thing it does, I think George alluded to the fact that you can have a VIP you can assign them to a trip. A lot of, a lot of the uh, South American countries and in some parts of the Middle East, the uh, executive, you know, it's like our old term of the key to the executive washroom. Well, this is the key to the express elevator. So uh, by encoding an express person's or a, very, a VIP person's destination on their card as they come through the building turnstile, they then can be assigned to a single elevator by themselves and do a one-time express trip, and then the elevator goes back into normal operation. The beauty of that is the other people waiting in the lobby are so attuned to queuing up in front of their own elevator, they don't notice that this VIP got on the elevator by himself. And uh, the other thing, that, and this, the, the uh, decision on this is still out. You know, we used to think that, gee, with, with double-deck elevators, uh, the, one of the big disadvantages of double leg elevators is always required odd even separation, which means typically people going to an odd floor in the zone would be on the bottom deck and people going to an even floor would be on the upper deck. So it's, you say, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could make the assignment each time you come in to either go on the upper deck or the lower deck? The real problem you have, and, that, and we found this out in, uh, uh, 
International Commerce Center in Hong Kong is that people forget their destination if they're assigned to an escalator. So we're back to the odd even and have two levels of uh, security turnstiles where people come in. But ultimately, if we had to get our assignments on iPads or some kind of device we carry around with us, that probably would work quite well. It also improves the design flexibility based on the cars, and uh, I just showed you that cars in a row. And uh, the, this is the other big advantage is uh, after 9-11, you probably don't build any office building without some kind of security check in the lobby. The first one I ever saw was installed by Otis in uh, World Trade Center 7 where they had turnstiles, you got your security credential check, went through the turnstiles, and you got your elevator assignment at the same time. So can't if you take nothing away from this lecture today, that's the key. Does not reduce the number of elevators. Uh, we've also found that the uh, office building tendencies are the best application. Because here you have a defined population that once they come in the first week the building's open, they probably don't change their patterns after that. So it's, it's very easy to train people and visitors coming to an office building to do that. The most difficult one is probably hotels. Uh, we did a modernization at the Marriott Hotel in New York where they actually added destination dispatch. and It improved the service tremendously because it's a very difficult hotel. It's up on the eighth floor where you check in. And uh, after the modernization, the ho Marriott Hotel executives came in there and said, boy, we, that's great. We want that in every one of our hotels. Then they started getting a lot of complaints about <laughs> no buttons in the elevators. We didn't know where we're going, so I think the verdict is out on hotels. Although it's probably applicable to residential buildings because we're doing a lot of residential buildings where they want to have VIP controls. And with these card readers, you can set up a whole hierarchy of who gets what service when. So I mean, here you got to buy the top penthouse for 20 million U.S. dollars on the very top. Are you going to give him the same service as somebody bought a a cheap $2 million unit or not? So you probably do. And they might want to pay for that. That might be the future. Um, the, one of the disadvantages, believe it or not, of destination dispatch is the evening down peak. It doesn't work nearly as well presently as a two-button conventional dispatch. And the main reason it doesn't is because it doesn't, typically most of the manufacturers do not put on low wing bypass. So I say we need to have low beam bypass on all elevators, whether conventional dispatching or two-button dispatching. And the reason for that is what happens with destination dip dispatch in the down direction, I'm supposed to come up to this uh, registration device and put in either one or zero to go down the ground floor. And it's relying on every person following me to put in their same destination. Well. I see Adrian come up and push the down button. I know he's going to the ground floor. What advantage is for me to push the down button? I don't, and all the follow-on people don't. So now the car stops, thinks only Adrian's going to get on, and 10 other people get on behind him. And what you don't realize is already made an assignment to pick up another two or three people in the down direction. Now the car is full. You can do one of two things. You can bypass and re-cancel the call and reassign it. Or you can open the doors with a whole bunch of people on there and people really get upset because the people in the car said, why did you stop us? And the people in the hall say, you know, we can't get on. What are you doing? So that's one disadvantage of uh, destination dispatching. And also we found out people can game the system. We have a beautiful system in Singapore where the turnstiles are probably 50 feet away from the lobby. So, and the... Uh, I'll show you the picture of the turnstiles. Anyhow, people walk through. Uh, these are the different input devices. And then the handicapped person, I think George covered that very well with the blind gal getting on. Uh, here's some of the other type of terminals. The key to these terminals we found is you must have this RFI capability. If you put in a dumb terminal like this, this is what happens in Singapore. People come to the turnstile, they, they don't wait for their assignment. They don't even bother to look. They just go right on through. And then they, when they get to the lobby, and what they don't realize is going through that turnstile with their encoded card, they've already registered a destination. 
They didn't get their assignment, now they walk over and they push the destination again. So now we got duplicate calls. We're getting 20, 30 percent duplicate calls. So the only way to prevent that is you don't let anybody register a call without uh, some kind of a reader, RFI reader. Because the beauty of this, if you come through a turn sound and you want to change your normal assignment because it's embedded on your card, you can then do that by identifying who you are and then it would cancel the call you had going through the turnstile and now you register the floor you really want to go to for that trip. These are typical turnstiles. The more modern ones have a canted display and we found out very quickly it's important to have, this is the security check going in the building, this is where the display is and you want to have this as far away from that one as you can possibly do. Some of the early ones had it right here. And those are ones where the people walk through and they don't even, I mean, I've seen guys walk through and then they stop and, you know, looking back here to see what the assignment is. It doesn't work very well. So here's some of the improvements I think are coming. I may be wrong, but it's a good guess. Obviously, the last thing we lack of that uh, dispatcher in the lobby is face recognition. So face recognition technology is here. It's probably just a matter of applying that probably right at the turnstile so you don't have to take anything out of your, don't have to show a card. It may be that you have the same kind of app embedded on your um, iPad. Although if somebody steals your iPad, they could come in, couldn't they? Um, so we talk about remote iPhone and iPad. GPS locations, building security credential checks, and lift assignment displays. These could all be remote as you're walking into the building, and they could time how long it takes you to get there. Uh, we talked about the radio in input device and software. The beauty of that, it reduces duplicate lift calls and people gaming the system. And it also permits you to cancel the whole call you were assigned and register a new one. And I think we need Believe it or not, how many people notice in most buildings throughout the world for pedestrians, when you go up to cross the street, there'll be a little sign that tells you how many seconds you have to get across. Why not have the same thing? One of the things that drives people nuts is they got their assignment and they said, gee, how many seconds away is that car? You know, I'd sure like to know when it's really going to get here because I'm getting antsy. So you could have a hall enter that has a countdown timer and then on the upper floors, it could have a reassignment display. So if you get that thing where the car becomes full and is going to bypass you, it can tell you that. And it tells you to register a new destination. I talked about load weighing bypass. I think that's really a necessity. And I know you don't do that in Europe. It's highly unusual to do that in Europe. The only, only weight weighing you have in uh, there's my countdown timer right there. <laughs> Anyhow, it won't take five minutes. I'm almost finished. Uh, load weighing, what we call load weighing in the United States is not load weighing you use in Europe. In the European version of load weighing is you have a car that's rated for 100% of the load, and as soon as I overload it, somebody has to get out. It won't leave. Our load weighing says, as soon as we, particularly in the down direction, are, are picking up people and the car becomes fully loaded at about 70%, we then bypass any further haul calls. And believe it or not, that's the reason that uh, destination dispatch and, and evening out peak and two button dispatch works. It's the same reason that destination dispatch works in the morning. How is it that we have the same elevator design for a morning up peak Say we have an eight-car group, and it might take an hour to get everybody up into that zone or the building. And then the same eight cars in the evening out peak can get everybody out of the building in 25 minutes. How is that possible? It's the same reason the destination dispatch works. We make, with load weighing bypass, we make two or three calls. The car is full. We bypass. The meeting goes down to the ground floor. People get off. There's no reason to hold the car. Nobody's going back up. So we immediately turn around and go up and pick up another load. So again, we get back to the number of dispatches. The number of dispatches in the down peak are increased dramatically, and that's why we can get everybody out of the building. We're also using this for, um, in super tall buildings, we're now providing what we call lifeboat operation to use elevators to get people out of the building during a disaster. 
there was a number of speakers here today that said, well, we'll just take people to a holding floor and let them wait for rescue. Well, I would submit to you after 9-11, nobody <laughs> wants to wait for rescue. I don't know how you feel, but if I knew something was going on in the building, I want to get out of the building immediately. I don't want it to collapse on me. That would be the visual image you'd have in your brain about the World Trade Center's collapsing. So what we're doing is we're taking the Sky Lobby shuttle elevators and probably the observatory elevators and some other high-rise elevators that are already there and using them to evacuate people from these refuge floors. So we get, most, most of the buildings we design, even though a lot of them are residential, we can get everybody out within under 60 minutes, which is quite a feat. And the other thing that happens in a super tall, 100-story plus building, you can't ask people to walk down 100 floors. It's hard, actually harder to walk down 100 floors than it is to walk up. It's very difficult. And particularly a lot of these tall buildings like Burj Khalifa and now Kingdom Tower are real high residential exclusive people and they're very wealthy people and they're very old people. <laughs> There's no way a you know, 70, 80 year old are gonna walk downstairs. So um, we think this lifeboat has got some real possibilities. But guess what? We can't use European design cars because they're 100% a load. You can imagine you're in an emergency, so people try to get on and say, sorry, we can't leave until somebody gets off. So you have to design the cars for 125% a load. And the only disadvantage of lifeboat is you have to then, each one of those cars have to have standby power, which adds some extra cost to it. But, uh, that's probably insignificant compared to trying to have everybody go down the stairs. And the last one is my favorite, you pay for express service. Whether anybody's got the guts to do that, I don't know, but I might pay. These are just some diagrams to show you the uh, different types of operation. These are typically, uh, originally we had the uh, input devices on the ends of the corridors, and they still do. And here's the problem with uh, double decks, you know, odd even. So ideally, you'd make the assignment out here based on whether you, this time you're going to go on an upper deck or lower deck into an odd or even floor. Ideally, you'd like to eliminate the odd even split by shorter, having shorter escalators. Um, but it also requires that we have some kind of screen out here that can differentiate to people what's happening. I know elevator companies don't like to have screens for destinations dispatch because they don't want the people to know which elevator could take them to their floor when they didn't register their destination. But I would submit to you because they've typically done it out in the turnstile, it doesn't matter anymore. You could easily display what is on the enunciator on these panels. And it might be have a countdown timer, tell the guys how many seconds it is. This just goes through the protocols of when you go through a turnstile, do I accept the uh, destination? Is that the one I want to go to? Or do I go over and then register a new call? And again, you have to have the, re almost always have to have the remote input device. This is the last slide. It shows uh, our version of what, going back to kind of a display lantern above each car, or it could be alongside each car. And that's basically my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>